Good morning. The next thing we're learning is in Pirkei Ovis is miut shena, to give up your sleep. So I want to understand what the practical ramifications of that. What does it mean, give up your sleep? Very interesting. The Gemara says that um, they asked the rabbi of Hamnuna Zuta to give a speech at a wedding. So he said a speech, the following speech he said at a wedding. Vailanda misna, vailanda misna. Whoa, we're going to die, we're going to die. Imagine the person who got up to speak at a wedding says, whoa, we're going to die, whoa, we're going to die. It's not recorded that he ever spoke a second time. <laughs> On the other hand, he only spoke he only spoke six words, so maybe he wasn't the speaker of choice. I'm not sure. <laughs> but what is what does that do with a wedding? What does it have to do with sleep? Is the thing in God said on the day you do the sin, Adam is going to die. And Adam lived another 930 years. So, But God said, on the day you sin, you're going to die. So it must be that man was able to internalize the fact that he, that he was going to die. How did, uh, he, God gave a person sleep. Sleep is the thing that gives us the feeling of connection to death. Sleep is echad b'shishim misa. It's one sixtieth of death. So the fact that a person had to go to sleep that right there, after he started sinning, he knew he had to sleep. That gave him that put in his body a feeling of of an internal connection to death. And of course, the more you appreciate death and you feel your mortality, the more you want to live. Whereas when you feel that you have your death, so that gives you a tremendous motivation to give an appreciation for life. That you don't want to disappear, and you feel your mortality, so what you want to do is celebrate life as much as you can. So therefore, the person getting up at a wedding says that if you really want to celebrate your life, just remember you're going to die. And therefore, it could very well be that the parents, the grandparents wouldn't be at the wedding. It could be that maybe the bride herself would die because we, death is a reality. So therefore, the fact that everybody's here is a tremendous feeling of an appreciation of the real joy of a simcha. Women have a greater connection to death because women have in their body each month cycle which there was a potential child and gets washed away each month so therefore she feels death and therefore she has a much greater connection to life a greater push for life and in fact our sages say that Moshe Rabbeinu said I should say that he says to God did I conceive these people? Did I give birth to these people? That you're telling me I should carry them like a nursemaid? Which the implication is that if you would have given birth to them, conceived them, give birth, then you have to treat somebody like a nursemaid. You have to be a nursing mother. You have to take care of them. And that's, that's in the feminine gender there, the whole thing. And that somebody who actually does give birth, has a great desire to impart life to the child. (coughs) You know, there's a modern thing today that we have a Sholem Zohar. A Sholem Zohar is when a male child is born, the Friday night before the bris, everybody comes together. And Tosfa says the reason for this is because the Pusik says, 
in Yeshayah Himlita Zohar, that a child could have died and it was saved and is born alive. So the modern people, they say, that's discriminatory. What about a Sholem Nekeva? So they have a Sholem Nekeva too. <laughs> but they don't understand anything. You know, when there's a Minig Yisrael, the Jewish people have a custom, it's because they understand the depth of what a, of what a custom is. So what are they doing? They're coming here to celebrate the child was born alive. Okay. What's the purpose of that? The purpose is to give the parents the feeling, especially the father, the feeling, which, by the way, almost any bris you go to, you'll hear the opposite. Give the father the feeling that he should be happy that he has a son. Not that this son will be the next greatest scholar of the age, or this son will be do something spectacular. You have to be happy that you just have a child, just to celebrate that there's a child. A healthy child itself is a celebration. We're not celebrating who this child is going to become, because that puts a lot of pressure on a child. If you want to know what he's not going to become, the parents put pressure on him, then you understand he's not going to become. Nobody likes pressure on them. You don't like pressure on you. I don't like pressure. When you pressure somebody, then they they pull back and do exactly the opposite. Everybody wants to be free of this, the pressure. It creates a tremendous stress on a person. So therefore, don't celebrate because you have this child who can now become rich or a child who can become famous or a child who can become a great Torah scholar. That's not, that's not what you celebrate. I'm celebrating I have a healthy child. Thank God I have a healthy child. And that's the message the community is trying to give the father. Don't do anything. Just celebrate he was healthy. By girls, traditionally, this was never a problem. Because girls, there was no great expectation. They, they stayed by their, around their mother and they learned from, <coughs> from her, her what to do, and there was no great expectation that she would have some accomplishment. She'd be a great mother, a good wife and a great mother, but not that she would have some independent comp- accomplishments. But today, that women get an education, and they, they themselves want to be a lawyer, they want to be a doctor, they, want, they have these expectations. So, therefore, if you can make a shalom the keva, it's not because you have a, a potential doctor or it's because you have a potential lawyer. It's because you shouldn't be looking for a doctor and a lawyer. You should just be happy that you have a healthy baby. That's what, that's what it should be. And that's the only reason why we make that party is to give everybody the, the understanding that... The whole purpose is just to celebrate a healthy child. And that we should be happy we have a healthy child, not we have a a potential one who can accomplish a lot. Remember, me, Shane, is the way we're supposed to be. Sometimes you have to give up your sleep. The Gemara says, Hani Nashi B'mai Zachyan. What is the merit of a woman? She gets up early to take her kids to school, and she stays up late waiting for her husband to return at night from, from learning, which means she gives up her sleep in order to develop people. Me chain is that she get to get the kids out in the morning, and if the husband's studying. He comes home at late at night. She's always waiting for him. She's available, waiting for him. And that gives him the encouragement to do things. That's the way you do it, through miu chena, giving up your own sleep in order to empower people. It's a very interesting... Um, Chazal says, Chochmas noshim bon sabesa. King Solomon says, The wisdom of women built her house. The Isha Evelis and a foolish woman, Tarsena, destroys it. Who's Chochmas Noshim Bonsa Besa? That's the wife of On Ben Pelis. Remember the story of On Ben Pelis that 
when they were making an assembly, a congregating to rebel against Moshe. So Om Ben Pelis's wife, a very interesting story. I'm telling you the way the Chazal tell us the story. And the story was like this, that she got her husband drunk and the people came to call him to join the meeting. They were going there in the morning to make an assembly to bring a Ketoros, um, a, uh, an, an offering, a spice offering, it's called Ketoros. And she got them drunk. She undid her hair. And they came to the door and said, where's, where's Own? So he was drunk. He was sleeping it off. And she was at the door. And when they saw that his wife's hair is uncovered, they're righteous people, they went away. And by the time he woke up, uh, they had all died already. And he was saved. That's Chochmas Noshim Bansa Besa. It's a very fascinating message of how you actually build somebody up. She could have just told him. Well, which it says she herself said. If the if the Kohen Godel is going to be Korach, or the high priest is going to be Aaron, could be, I don't know, I don't know who's greater, but I know one thing, it's not going to be you. So what are you getting involved in something what are you getting involved in something that's you have nothing to gain from? So why did she just tell him that? Why didn't she just tell him that? Why 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 did she have to get him drunk and then a very fascinating thing here. If you realize your husband has some limitations, the idea is not to remind him of his limitations. The idea is to just maneuver the situation that he doesn't get caught up. But you, you can't make give a person a feeling he's limited. That 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 breaks a person. Oh, I'm not. My wife thinks I'm not capable. That's a very. That's not a healthy thing to do. And therefore, I mean, if he would have asked her advice, is one thing, but he didn't ask her what to do. So she herself knew that he wasn't capable. But she didn't want to, she wouldn't tell him that because that takes away a person's self-esteem. But what she did was she maneuvered a situation whereby he was drunk and he was sleeping. And by the time he woke up, they had already brought the guitarist and they had all been burned. Or hung or swallowed up either way, whatever, whatever happened to them there. That's the Chachmas Noshim. The smartest thing is to make sure that a person is not telling somebody of a limitation. Women have the special ability to empower. When you give a person a feeling of a limitation, that doesn't empower them. That makes them feel un- not capable. That's the opposite of empowering. So it's very smart to do it in a way that they should be empowered. The husband doesn't feel that his wife doesn't hold him in the greatest of esteem and therefore he still feels very good about himself and she just does an end run and maneuvers the situation whereby he won't be confronted with the test. It's very smart. Ishi Velistar Sena, that's the wife of Korach. Now it's true. Korach might have been as capable as Aaron. I mean, he might he might have been capable to be the high priest. So well, a wife should encourage her husband. You can be this, you can be that. Wrong there too. A very fascinating thing how you empower somebody. Did anybody feel that Aaron was not capable of being the high priest? It was just that Korach is also capable. Aaron maybe is even more, I'm not even saying that, that Aaron is not more capable than Korach. But, so Aaron is overqualified for the job. But Korach was holy enough and smart enough that he could have done it too. He's, he is capable of doing it, and it's true. Korach could have actually been the high priest. He was capable of being the high priest. 
but the fact that somebody's capable of something is not a reason they should do it unless there's a problem, unless somebody doesn't have the... Um, unless Aaron is not doing the job taking care of the of the office of Cohen Gottel properly, there's no reason to replace him. There was no reason to replace anybody here. So the fact that your husband could do the job too, that's not the issue. The <coughs> issue is, do we have somebody that needs to be replaced? And therefore, when you motivate your husband to do something because he can do it, that's not a healthy thing too either. Because... Is there a need for him? Somebody else is doing the job. That's good enough for that's a good enough reason that he should keep the job. You don't have any reason to take something away from somebody because you're capable of doing it. So there's a huge two lessons from both sides how you empower somebody. The way you empower somebody is you do an end run so he doesn't get confronted. And the fact that he does have the ability to do it, you make sure that there's a need for him to do it. And if there's no need for him to do it, that somebody else could do it, then back off and don't do anything. That's the takeaway from the story. Now I want to talk about this week's Parsha, because we always find something in the Parsha that gives the same message. The Pusik says like this. Vayomer Melech Mitzrayim Lameyadus Ivrios. Pharaoh, Pharaoh said to the Jewish midwives, the two ones that are in charge of all the midwives, Shifrim Pua, that's Yocheved and Miriam. When you give birth to the ch- Jewish children, you should look. You'll, you'll take a look when they're in their stirrups. If it's a boy, you'll kill him. And if it's a girl, you'll let her live. And the Mialdas had the fear of God, Velo Osu, and they did not do Kashir Dibrale Melch Mitzrayim, like the king of Egypt said, but the Chayena Sayyelodim. And they let them live. So the rabbis say a fascinating thing. Vatirenu Hamialdas, they were had fear of God. And they didn't do as the king of Egypt told them. What did he say? He said to them, I want you to, the two of you should live with me. He was, he asked, he said, I want you to be intimate with me. That's what he told the two of them. And they didn't do that. What's that doing anything? Why, why should he be interested in, why should he be interested in being intimate with him? He's trying to destroy the Jewish people. He's trying to destroy all the men, and all of a sudden, he's interested in, in taking two Jewish girls. I mean, well, how does that deal with the problem? He's saying a fascinating thing. The women are the ones that empower the Jewish people, that define us as a nation, that they build a nation. If he takes the two leading Jew- Jewesses of the time, Yochevet and Miriam, and he gets them to live with him, that, then he takes away the sanctity of the Jewish people. And that itself would be devastating to the morale of the Jewish people. The Jewish people look at their mothers as the ones who give them vitality, a sense of purpose, a sense of importance, and now they find out that their mothers are sleeping with the king of Egypt that would take away, would diminish their empowerment that they're getting from their mothers. And therefore he would be just as successful. He would he would destroy them as a nation. In fact, the language of the Medrash is like this. If Pyro had the ability to do whatever he wanted, to, to the, he, he was show like he had total control of their, over their bodies, so he didn't have control over the women. Anybody who has control over somebody, somebody's your slave, 
you can do whatever you want with you can do whatever you want with 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 with, with the uh, with his wife. So, our sages say that it says when God counts the Jewish people, He put a, a yud and a hey in their name. The yud and hey is the name of God that they they never lost their they never they didn't lose their holiness. They were their mothers remained devoted and. To their husbands that didn't have any relations with the Egypt with the Egyptians, which means had they had that, that would have been a, a tremendous devastation to the entire people. So Paro thought that he would, in order to save their lives and save. And re- remember, they're doing this to save the children. That if if you have relations with me, then I'm not killing the Jewish men. I mean, there's a big motivation for a woman to do this. She's saving saving boys otherwise the boys are going to be killed and I'm not going to kill them if you if you are intimate with me that's true but they'll be dead because they won't have the the mother won't have the ability to empower them she has to empower she defines she creates the holiness of the nation uh, and and our sense of specialty that we have mothers that are devoted to holiness and to our growth and to our definition that's enough reason to be devastated if I find out that the two greatest women, I mean, one of them is married to Amram, to the Godot, to the chief rabbi. The other one is married to an exceptional person too. And if they would give up their, betray their husbands and betray there wouldn't be any respect for them in, among the children, and therefore that would be a, a undermine the holiness of the Jewish people and undermine our strength of an, as a nation. And therefore, so, so the Pesach is telling us how women have to empower their husbands, empower their children, and not succumb to all other things to save lives is not a that's not a good enough reason save lives is not a good enough reason we're dealing with much higher stakes here also we have another story in this week's Parsha Moshe goes to the well and he sees that the daughters of Yisro are being chased away, that they're not allowed to uh, draw water. So he starts up with the shepherds, and he says to the daughters of Yisro, make sure you can draw, you can draw water. They were upset with him because Yisro had become religious, and he, he was the leader, and they didn't want to bring any kind of religion to the city of Midian. And they didn't let his, and, and he sends his daughters to draw water, and they don't want to draw water because he's undermining the, the culture of Midian. So Moshe fights them, and he, and he lets the daughters draw water. They go home, and they tell their father, what happened? Those, I guess they came home earlier than they usually came. They didn't wait till the end. Everybody else went there. And he says, so where is he? You didn't bring him into the house? You didn't invite him home? You didn't invite him home? That it's also an incredible thing. You didn't, what do you mean? You, you, you hear the kind, you, don't, you didn't invite him home? He just, he just did you such a big favor, you didn't invite him home? Which also gives the message that a woman's job is to show her appreciation. Someone does a favor to make him feel good about what he did, and you bring him home. You 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 you, you invite him to the house to, to have a meal. Eventually, he came to the house, had a meal, and he wound up marrying marrying the daughter who he had saved. So. 
it didn't turn out too bad for them either. But that's also empowering is to let a person show him appreciation. When you show a person appreciation of what he does, that gives a person empowerment, which is a very important message too. A woman has to be the one to show appreciation all the time so that the man or the guests that come to a house feel appreciated and that makes them feel good because that empowers them. People come to your house, they should walk away empowered. And the way they walk away empowered is if you give them the feeling that you appreciate their, their coming you appreciate your coming or you appreciate something they did for you during the week and how could I not invite you you did this for me and that's a very important feeling to convey a person to convey to a person I'll give you an example for that when you do a favor for somebody they feel very uncomfortable nobody likes to take favors you make a person feel uncomfortable. Somebody comes in and is collecting for yeshiva. And uh, he's really uncomfortable because even if you give money, he doesn't feel good. You're doing him a favor. So he doesn't feel comfortable even, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, you don't feel comfortable asking a person for money either because the person's doing you a favor. It's a very uncomfortable feeling. The way you do this in the right way, and we'll see this is what the women did, is how can I not do you a favor? When my son was in yeshiva, you always invited him to your house for Shabbos. So you're making him feel that he's was owed what you did for him. That makes a person feel good. The way to empower a person who's asking who's asking you something that looks like a favor, give him a reason that he's entitled to it. That's a, a very smart thing to do, and there's usually a reason. Either he invited you to his house, he invited your children to the house, or even better, you could say, um, who didn't hear of Panovich Yeshiva? The, the, the whole world knows about Panovich Yeshiva. It's such an outstanding, it's where all the scholars are being developed. So you gave a person a feeling that they're not doing you a favor, but the, you're doing them a favor by allowing them to pay back a debt that, the, that they have to society, a debt that they have to, a debt that we have to society, so we're paying, we're, I'm, I'm giving you money because I feel a debt to society that, Panovich, I'm just using an example, has produced so many nice scholars that it's been a positive feeling for the community. You know, when it comes, someone says, you know, I'm telling you, you don't like asking people for money. You need yeshiva needs money. But if someone says, how can I not? You know, you you brought Torah to Miami Beach, and you've given such a feeling for the community that it's a place that we can live here now, and our kids can live here because there's yeshiva here, then I feel comfortable. I feel comfortable. That's the way you empower somebody. That's the way you empower somebody, and that's what the women do. They figure out ways to empower the, their company, ways to empower their guests. And that's done in this week's Parsha. It's tremendous empowerment. And that's, a, and that's a, a very important thing in learning how to empower somebody you do a favor to them. Then there's another story. in the Parsha. The Jewish people were not procreating. They were exhausted. They were working hard. They didn't want to have any ch more children. They had enough. And, you know, and plus the fact that a lot of the children were being born and drowned and killed. and They didn't have any interest. The women came and they brought fish hot water, fish, and gave their husbands <coughs> water and fish and water. And then it says, Tachas HaTapuch HaRaratich, and therefore they were able to stimulate their husbands to have relations with them. And that's where 
tens of myriads of Jews were born. That's the post that we learn out, that they, they, they came to their husbands in the field, and they brought them sustenance, and they, and they um, lived with them, and, and that, that created many, many Jewish, myriads of Jewish people. That's what it says. You think it was true? The men, the men were tired. We think the women were tired too. The women were tired too. It's not only they were tired from women that were working too. They were also tired. And not only that, they were also emotionally exhausted because they were losing their children. So there was a huge tire and a huge emotionally devastated. But women, miyuchena, is they gave up some of their sleep, their tiredness, and they did this to motivate their husbands to have more children, and that built up the Jewish people. That's a very, very profound message that even in Egypt, when we became a nation, we needed the women, miyuchena, to give up their sleep. They were exhausted, but nevertheless, emotionally exhausted, physically exhausted, but nevertheless, they did what was necessary in order to build the Jewish people. That's what a woman does. She's a builder of the, our nation. And in that merit, that's what we have the Jewish people today. <laughs> Two questions. First of all, so we know so little about Zipporah, like how, what she did to merit marrying someone like Moshe. So, but she failed the test to invite Moshe to her house. Like that Yisro had to tell her, why didn't you invite him home? Am I getting that right? But she, she got the lesson. That was a lesson. But like I'm saying, she must have been so amazing that she gets to marry Moshe Rabbeinu. A hundred percent. I mean, you realize that she... She was totally subservient to her father's wishes of anti-idolatry, right? He was, the, he was on his search for truth, and she empowered her father because she was doing the work of a shepherdess. The girls were, were not shepherdesses, but she did that in order to make her fa- father feel that his search for truth is something that she wants to sustain. And so... What he was doing, the father just added, it's not only you're empowering me, you have to empower everybody. You have to empower the people who do you favors too. But being a shepherdess and having to take abuse in order that her father's dream of being able to find the right God, she helped him on his journey, was itself a tremendous merit for her. So it's... If a, if a girl's a great father, then she becomes a great daughter, then she becomes a great wife, too. And it has one other question also. The idea that Paro wanted the women to live with him, and then he would have saved the Mialdas to live with him, and then he would have saved the babies. So, like, let's say in the time of the Nazis, if they had said, can two women live with us, and then we'll let a lot of people live. Would that have, would that have been, like, the way to go? No, that's what you're not supposed to do. Right, and saying that's what they would have done. That would have yeah, I mean, I'm sure there were people who did that. But the majority didn't do that. And, and, uh, and like, it's better they should just kill more. And, and then the ones, and when they came out of the camps, the few that survived came out strong. And I mean, it's unbelievable what they accomplished since then. They built the Jewish people, too. The Jews who came out of the crematoriums built the state of Israel in 70 years, which is an unbelievable uh, accomplishment because there was a tremendous strength and belief in, in the special m- mission of the Jewish people. And who, who, who converted Israel? What? How did Israel convert? He, he searched for truth. There were no Jews around him. He was living in a different country than the Jews. He was a Midian. He was so living he in Midian. Jewish? What? He became Jewish? He, he, he converted. Then he, at Sinai, he, he didn't convert to Judaism until till Sinai. In fact, the story of the Torah, the Parsha, which talks about Kabbalah's Torah, is called Parsha's Yisro. Because mm-hmm. he, eventually, he eventually became the role model for everybody of conversion. But he he had a search for truth, which is a message for all of us that it's not religion isn't just something you 
believing because somebody told you. It's it can be independently verified without any. It's it's so it's so compelling the arguments for 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 the existence of God that. They can be independently verified. You don't need a tradition. In fact, his deal with Moshe is that the first child will not be brought up religious. The child won't be brought up religious. Not me. He's going to make anti-religious. Let him find the truth. I found the truth. I don't want to. I don't want to brainwash him. I found the truth, and I'm much stronger because I found it on my own. Therefore, his oldest son was also Gershon. Was exactly the same. He was brought up. That uh, there's a medrash right there. He brought in in, on, in this week's parsha that says he was brought up that way too. Everybody have a great Shabbos.